We welcome Sweet Dreamers to relax with comfort. Your favorite haven for cozy sleep stories. My name is Comfort and I am your host. I happily welcome you to the first podcast of the year 2024. This year, I hope life treats you kindly. May you love yourself more and may you conquer your fears. I hope that the goodness in store for you surpasses even your wildest dreams. If you love drifting off to the sound of soothing stories, I invite you to subscribe to my channel. And if you have enjoyed listening to any of my contents, do give me a like on this video. Tonight we delve into the timeless tales of Trusty John and Prince Darling. In the former, we witness the unwavering devotion of his servant, who braves fire and dies to rescue his beloved master. In the latter, we encounter a cursed prince waiting for the touch of true love to break the spell that binds him. But before then, let's talk you in. Close your eyes, dear listener, and let the cares of the day dissolve like frost against a rising sun. In your mind, feel the weight of your anxieties slip away gradually, replaced by the comforting love of my voice. Imagine the cool night air rushing against your cheeks as you step into the moonlit forest. With every stride you take, feel the soft moss beneath your feet. Breathe in the crisp scent of pine needles and damp air, and slowly exhale as you softly whisper to yourself. I am letting me go of all tension. I am letting me go of all tension. Repeat this process a few times, allowing your body and mind to surrender to the rhythm of relaxation. Sweet dreams. Prince Darling Once upon a time, there lived a king who was so just and kind that his subjects called him the Good King. It happened one day when he was out hunting that a little white rabbit, which his dogs were chasing, sprang into his arms for shelter. The king stroked it gently and said to it, Well, bunny, as you have come to me for protection, I will see that nobody hurts you. And he took it home to his palace and had it put in a pretty little house with all sorts of nice things to eat. That night, When he was alone in his room, a beautiful lady suddenly appeared before him. Her long dress was as white as snow, and she had a crown of white roses upon her head. The good king was very much surprised to see her, for he knew his door had been tightly shut, and he could not think how she had gotten. But she said to him, I am the fairy truth. 
I was passing through the wood when you were out hunting. And I wished to find out if you were really good. As everybody said you were. So I took the shape of a little rabbit and came to your arms for shelter. For I know that those who are merciful to animals will be still kinder to their fellow men. If you had refused to help me, I should have been certain that you were wicked. I thank you for the kindness you have shown me, which has made me your friend forever. You have only to ask me for anything you want and I promise that I will give it to you. Madam, said the good king, since you are a fairy, you no doubt know all my wishes. I have but one son, whom I loved very dearly. That is why he is called Prince Darling. If you are really good enough to wish to do me a favor, I beg that you will become his friend. With all my heart, answered the fairy. I can make your son the handsomest prince in the world, or the richest, or the most powerful. Choose whichever you like for him. I do not ask either of these things for my son, replied the good king. But if you will make him the best of princes, I shall indeed be grateful to you. What good would it do him to be rich, or handsome, or to possess all the kingdoms of the world, if he were wicked? You know well he would still be unhappy. Only a good man can be really contented. You are quite right, answered the fairy. But it is not in my power to make Prince Darling a good man unless he will help me. He must himself try hard to become good. I can only promise to give him good advice, to scold him for his faults and to punish him if he will not correct and punish himself. The good king was quite satisfied with this promise and very soon afterward he died. Prince Darling was very sorry for he loved his father with all his heart and he would willingly have given all his kingdoms and all his treasures of gold and silver if they could have kept the good king with him. Two days afterward, when the prince had gone to bed, the fairy suddenly appeared to him and said, I promised your father that I would be your friend, and to keep my word, I have come to bring you a present. At the same time, she put a little gold ring upon his finger. Take great care of this ring, she said. It is more precious than diamonds. Every time you do a bad deed, it will prick your finger. But if, in spite of its pricking, you go on in your own evil way, you will lose my friendship and I shall become your enemy. So saying, the fairy disappeared leaving Prince Darling very much astonished. For some time, he behaved so well that the ring never pricked him, and that made him so contented that his subjects called him Prince Darling the Happy. One day, however, he went out hunting but could get no sport, which put him in a very bad temper. 
It seemed to him as he rode along that his ring was pressing into his finger. But as it did not break him, he did not heed it. When he got home and went to his own room, his little dog Bibi ran to meet him, jumping round him with pleasure. Get away, said the prince quite gruffly. I don't want you, you are in the way. The poor little dog, who didn't understand this at all, pulled at his coat to make him at least look at her. And this made Prince Darling so cross that he gave her quite a hard kick. Instantly, his ring pricked him sharply as if it had been a pin. He was very much surprised and sat down in a corner of his room feeling quite ashamed of himself. I believe the fairy is laughing at me, he thought. Surely I can have done no great wrong in just kicking a tiresome animal. What is the good of my being ruler of a great kingdom if I am not even allowed to beat my own dog? I am not making fun of you, said a voice, answering Prince Darling's thoughts. You have committed three faults. First of all, you were out of temper because you could not have what you wanted. And you thought all men and animals were only made to do your pleasure. Then you were really angry, which is very naughty indeed. And lastly, you were cruel to a poor little animal who did not in the least deserve to be ill-treated. I know you are far above a little dog, but if it were right and allowable that great people should ill-treat all who are beneath them, I might at this moment beat you or kill you, for a fairy is greater than a man. The advantage of possessing a great empire is not to be able to do the evil that one desires, but to do all the good that one possibly can. The prince saw how naughty he had been and promised to try and do better in future. But he did not keep his word. The fact was he had been brought up by a foolish nurse who had spoiled him when he was little. If he wanted anything, he only had to cry and fret and stamp his feet, and she would give him whatever he asked for, which had made him self-willed. Also, she had told him from morning to night that he would one day be a king, and that kings were very happy because everyone was bound to obey and respect them and no one could prevent them from doing just as they liked. When the prince grew old enough to understand, he soon learned that there could be nothing worse than to be proud, obstinate and conceited, and he had really tried to cure himself of these defects. But by that time, all his faults had become habits, and a bad habit is very hard to get rid of. Not that he was naturally of a bad disposition, he was truly sorry when he had been naughty, and said, I am very unhappy to have to struggle against my anger and pride every day. If I had been punished for them when I was little, they would not be such a trouble to me now. His ring pricked him very often and sometimes he left off what he was doing at once. But at other times he would not attend to it. 
Strangely enough, it gave him only a slight break for a trifling fault. But when he was really naughty, it made his finger actually bleed. At last, he got tired of being constantly reminded and he wanted to be able to do as he liked. So he threw his ring aside and thought himself the happiest of men to have got rid of its teasing pricks. He gave himself up to doing every foolish thing that occurred to him, until he became quite wicked and nobody could like him any longer. One day, when the prince was walking about, he saw a young girl who was so very pretty that he made up his mind at once that he would marry her. Her name was Celia and she was as good as she was beautiful. Prince Darling fancied that Celia would think herself only too happy if he offered to make her a great queen. But she said fearlessly, Sire, I am only a shepherdess and the poor girl, but nevertheless I will not marry you. Do you dislike me? asked the prince, who was very much vexed at this answer. No, my prince, replied Celia. I cannot help thinking you very handsome, but what good would riches be to me and all the grand dresses and splendid carriages that you would give me if the bad deeds which I should see you do every day made me hate and despise you? The prince was very angry at this speech and commanded his officers to make Celia a prisoner and carry her off to his palace. All day long, the remembrance of what she had said annoyed him, but as he loved her, he could not make up his mind to have her punished. One of the prince's favorite companions was his foster brother, whom he trusted entirely, but he was not at all a good man, and gave Prince Darling very bad advice and encouraged him in all his evil ways. When he saw the prince so downcast, he asked what was the matter, and when he explained that he could not bear Celia's bad opinion of him, and was resolved to be a better man in order to please her, this evil advisor said to him, you are very kind to trouble yourself about this little girl. If I were you, I would soon make her obey me. Remember that you are a king and that it would be laughable to see you trying to please a shepherdess who ought to be only too glad to be one of your slaves. Keep her in prison and feed her on bread and water for a little while. And then, if she still says she will not marry you, have her head cut off, to teach other people that you mean to be obeyed. Why, if you cannot make a girl like that to do as you wish, your subjects will soon forget that they are only put in this world for our pleasure. But, said Prince Darling, would it not be a shame if I had an innocent girl put to death? For Celia has done nothing to deserve punishment. If people will not do as you tell them, they ought to suffer for it, answered his foster brother. But even if it were unjust, you had better be accused of that by your subjects than that they should find out that they may insult and thwart you as often as they please. 
In saying this, he was touching a weak point in his brother's character. For the prince's fear of losing any of his power made him at once abandon his first idea of trying to be good and resolved to try and frighten the shepherdess into consenting to marry him. His foster brother, who wanted him to keep this resolution, invited three young courtiers, as wicked as himself, to sup with the prince, and they persuaded him to drink a great deal of wine and continued to excite his anger against Celia by telling him that she had laughed at his love for her. Until at last, in quite a furious rage, he rushed off to find her, declaring that if she still refused to marry him, she should be sold as a slave the very next day. But when he reached the room in which Celia had been locked up, he was greatly surprised to find that she was not in it, though he had the key in his own pocket all the time. His anger was terrible, and he vowed vengeance against whoever had helped her to escape. His bad friends, when they heard him, resolved to turn his wrath upon an old nobleman who had formerly been his tutor, and who still dared sometimes to tell the prince of his faults, for he loved him as if he had been his own son. At first, Prince Darling had thanked him, but after a time he grew impatient and thought it must be just mere love or fault-finding that made his old tutor blame him when everyone else was praising and flattering him. So he ordered him to retire from his court, though he still from time to time spoke of him as a worthy man whom he respected, even if he no longer loved him. His unworthy friends feared that he might someday take it into his head to recall his old tutor so they thought they now had a good opportunity of getting him banished forever. They reported to the prince that Suleiman, for that was the tutor's name, had boasted of having helped Celia to escape, and they bribed three men to say that Suleiman himself had told them about it. The prince, in great anger, sent his foster brother with a number of soldiers to bring his tutor before him, in chains, like a criminal. After giving this order, he went to his own room, but he had scarcely gotten to it when there was a clap of thunder which made the ground shake. and. The fairy truth appeared suddenly before him. I promised your father, said she sternly, to give you good advice and to punish you if you refused to follow it. You have despised my counsel and have gone your own evil way until you are only outwardly a man. Really, you are a monster. The horror of everyone who knows you. It is time that I should fulfill my promise and begin your punishment. I condemn you to resemble the animals whose ways you have imitated. You have made yourself like the lion by your anger and like the wolf by your greediness. Like a snake, you have ungratefully turned upon one who was a second father to you. Your churlishness has made you like a bull. Therefore, in your new form, take the appearance of all these animals. The fairy had scarcely finished speaking when Prince Darling saw to his horror that her words were fulfilled. 
He had a lion's head, a bull's horns, a wolf's feet, and a snake's body. At the same instant, he found himself in a great forest, beside a clear lake, in which he could see plainly the horrible creature he had become. And a voice said to him, Look carefully at the state to which your wickedness has brought you. Believe me, your soul is a thousand times more hideous than your body. Prince Darling recognized the voice of the fairy truth and turned in a fury to catch her and eat her up if he possibly could. But he saw no one and the same voice went on. I laugh at your powerlessness and anger, and I intend to punish your pride by letting you fall into the hands of your own subjects. The prince began to think that the best thing he could do would be to get as far away from the lake as he could. Then at least he would not be continually reminded of his terrible ugliness. So he ran towards the wood, but before he had gone many yards, he fell into a deep pit, which had been made to trap bears, and the hunters who were hiding in a tree leaped down and secured him with several chains, and led him into the chief city of his own kingdom. On the way, Instead of recognizing that his own faults had brought this punishment upon him, he accused the fairy of being the cause of all his misfortune, and beat and tore at his chains furiously. As they approached the town, he saw that some great rejoicing was being held, and when the hunters asked what has happened, they were told that the prince whose only pleasure it was to torment his people had been found in his room, killed by a thunderbolt, for that was what was supposed to have become of him. Four of his courtiers, those who had encouraged him in his wicked doings, had tried to seize the kingdom and divide it between them. But the people who knew it was their bad counsels which had so changed the prince, had cut off their heads and had offered the crown to Solomon, whom the prince had left in prison. This noble lord had just been crowned, and the deliverance of the kingdom was the cause of the rejoicing. For, they said, he is a good and just man, and we shall once more enjoy peace and prosperity. Prince Darling roared with anger when he heard this, but it was still worse for him when he reached the great square before his own palace. He saw Solomon seated upon a magnificent throne, and all the people crowded round, wishing him a long life, that he might undo all the mischief done by his predecessor. Presently, Solomon made a sign with his hand that the people should be silent, and said, I have accepted the crown you have offered me, but only that I may keep it for Prince Darling who is not dead as you suppose. The fairy has assured me that there is still hope that you may some day see him again, good and virtuous as he was when he first came to the throne. Alas, he continued, he was led away by flatterers. I knew his heart and I am certain that if it had not been for the bad influence of those who surrounded him, he would have been a good king and a father to his people. 
We may hate his faults, but let us pity him and hope for his restoration. As for me, I would die gladly if that could bring back our prince to reign justly and worthily once more. These words went to Prince Darling's heart. He realized the true affection and faithfulness of his old tutor and, for the first time, reproached himself for all his evil deeds. At the same instant, he felt all his anger melting away and he began quickly to think over his past life and to admit that his punishment was not more than he had deserved. He left off, tearing at the iron bars of the cage in which he was shut off, and became gentle as a lamb. The hunters who had caught him took him to a great menagerie, where he was chained up among all the other wild beasts, and he determined to show his sorrow for his past bad behavior by being gentle and obedient to the man who had to take care of him. Unfortunately, this man was very rough and unkind, and though the poor monster was quite quiet, he often beat him without rhyme or reason when he happened to be in a bad temper. One day, when this keeper was asleep, the tiger broke its chain and flew at him to eat him up. Prince Darling, who saw what was going on at first, felt quite pleased to think that he should be delivered from his persecutor. But soon, thought better of it and wished that he were free. I would return good for evil, he said to himself, and save the unhappy man's life. He had hardly wished this when his iron cage flew open, and he rushed to the side of the keeper who was away and was defending himself against the tiger. When he saw the monster had got out, he gave himself up for lost. But his fear was soon changed into joy, for the kind monster threw itself upon the tiger and very soon killed it. Overcome with gratitude, the keeper stooped to caress the strange creature which had done him such a great service. But suddenly a voice said in his ear, a good action should never go unrewarded, and at the same instant the monster disappeared, and he saw at his feet only a pretty little dog. Prince Darling, delighted by the change, frisked about the keeper, showing his joy in every way he could, and the man taking him up in his arms, carried him to the king, to whom he told the whole story. The queen said she would like to have this wonderful little dog, and the prince would have been very happy in his new home if he could have forgotten that he was a man and a king. The queen petted and took care of him, but she was so afraid that he would get too fat, that she consulted the court physician who said that he was to be fed only upon bread and was not to have much even of fat. So poor Prince Darling was terribly hungry all day long, but he was very patient about it. One day, when they gave him his little loaf for breakfast, he thought he would like to eat it out in the garden. So he took it up in his mouth and trotted away toward a brook that he knew of a long way from the palace. 
but he was surprised to find that the brook was gone and where it had been stood a great house that seemed to be built of gold and precious stones. Numbers of people splendidly dressed were going in to eat and sounds of music and dancing and feasting would be heard from the windows. But what seemed very strange was that those people who came out of the house were pale and thin and their clothes were torn and hanging in rags about them. Some fell down dead as they came out before they had the time to get away. Others crawled farther with great difficulty, while others again lay on the ground, fainting with hunger and begged a morsel of bread from those who were going into the house. But they would not so much as look at the poor creatures. Prince Darling went up to a young girl who was trying to eat a few blades of grass. She was so hungry. Touched with compassion, he said to himself, I am very hungry, but I shall not die of starvation before I get my dinner. If I give my breakfast to this poor creature, perhaps I may save her life. So, he laid his piece of bread in the girl's hand and saw her eat it up eagerly. She soon seemed to be quite well again and the prince, delighted to have been able to help her, was thinking of going home to the palace when he heard a great outcry and turning round saw Celia who was being carried against her will into the great house. For the first time, the prince regretted that he was no longer the monster. Then he would have been able to rescue Celia. Now he could only bark feebly at the people who were carrying her off and try to follow them, but they chased and kicked him away. He determined not to quit the place till he knew what had become of Celia and blamed himself for what had befallen her. Alas, he said to himself, I am furious with the people who are carrying Celia off, but isn't that exactly what I did myself? And if I had not been prevented, did I not intend to still be more cruel to her? Here, he was interrupted by a noise above his head. Someone was opening a window and he saw with delight that it was Celia herself who came forward and threw out a plate of most delicious looking food. Then the window was shut again. And Prince Darling, who had not had anything to eat all day, thought he might as well take the opportunity of getting something. He ran forward to begin, but the young girl to whom he had given his bread gave a cry of terror and took him up in her arms, saying, Don't touch it, my poor little dog. That house is the palace of pleasure, and everything that comes out of it is poison. At the same moment, the voice said, You see a good action always bring its reward, and the prince found himself changed into a beautiful white dove. He remembered that white was the favorite color of the fairy truth, and began to hope that he might at last win back her favor. But just now, his first care was for Celia, and rising into the air, he flew round and round the house, 
until he saw an open window. But he searched through every room in vain. No trace of Celia was to be seen, and the prince, in despair, determined to search through the world till he found her. He flew on and on for several days, till he came to a great desert, where he saw a cavern and, to his delight, there sat Celia, sharing the simple breakfast of an old hermit. Overjoyed to have found her, Prince Darling perched upon her shoulder, trying to express by his caresses how glad he was to see her again. And Celia, surprised and delighted by the tameness of this pretty white dove, stroked it softly and said, though she never thought of it understanding her. I accept the gift that you make me of yourself and I will love you always. Take care what you are saying, Celia, said the old hermit. Are you prepared to keep that promise? Indeed, I hope so, my sweet shepherdess, cried the prince, who was at that moment restored to his natural shape. You promised to love me always. Tell me that you really mean what you say, or I shall have to ask the fairy to give me back the form of the dove which pleased you so much. You need not be afraid that she will change her mind, said the fairy, throwing off the hermit robe in which she had been disguised and appearing before them. Celia has loved you ever since she first saw you. Only she would not tell you while you were so obstinate and naughty. Now you have repented and mean to be good. You deserve to be happy. And so she may love you as much as she likes. Celia and Prince Darling threw themselves at the fairy's feet, and the prince was never tired of thanking her for her kindness. Celia was delighted to hear how sorry he was for all his past follies and misdeeds, and promised to love him as long as she lived. Rise, my children said the fairy, and I will transport you to the palace, and Prince Darling shall have back again the crown he forfeited by his bad behavior. While she was speaking, they found themselves in Solomon's hall, and his delight was great at seeing his dear master once more. He gave up the throne joyfully to the prince and remained always the most faithful of his subjects. Celia and Prince Darling reigned for many years, but he was so determined to govern worthily and to do his duty that his ring, which he took to wearing again, never once pricked him severely. Trusty John. Once upon a time, there was an old king who was so ill that he thought to himself, I am most likely on my deathbed. Then he said, Send Trusty John to me. Now, Trusty John was his favorite servant and was so called because all his life, he had served him so faithfully. 
When he approached the bed, the king spake to him, Most trusty John, I feel my end is drawing near, and I could face it without a care were it not for my son. He is still too young to decide everything for himself, and unless you promise me to instruct him in all he should know, and to be to him as a father, I shall not close my eyes and peace. Then trusty John answered, I will never desert him, and will serve him faithfully, even though it should cost me my life. Then the old king said, Now I die comforted and in peace. And then he went on, After my death, you must show him the whole castle, all the rooms and apartments and vaults, and all the treasures that lie in them. But you must not show him the last room in the long passage, where the picture of the princess of the golden roof is hidden. When he beholds that picture, he will fall violently in love with it and go off into a dead faint, and for her sake he will encounter many dangers. You must guard him from this. And when trusty John had again given the king his hand upon it, the old man became silent, laid his head on the pillow and died. When the old king had been carried to his grave, Trusty John told the young king what he had promised his father on his deathbed, and added, And I shall assuredly keep my word, and shall be faithful to you as I have been to him, even though it should cost me my life. Now, when the time of mourning was over, Trusty John said to him, It is time you should see your inheritance. I will show you your ancestral castle. So he took him over everything and let him see all the ridges and splendid apartments. Only the one room where the picture was he did not open. But the picture was placed so that if the door opened, you gazed straight upon it, and it was so beautifully painted that you imagined it lived and moved, and that it was the most lovable and beautiful thing in the whole world. But the young king noticed that trusty John always missed one door, and said, Why do you never open this one for me? There is something inside that would appall you, he answered. But the king replied, I have seen the whole castle and shall find out what is in there. And with these words he approached the door and wanted to force it open. But trusty John held him back and said, I promised your father before his death that you shouldn't see what that room contains. It might bring both you and me to great grief. Ah, no, answered the young king. If I don't get in, it will be my certain destruction. I should have no peace night or day till I had seen what was in the room with my own eyes. Now, I don't budge from the spot till you have opened the door. Then trusty John saw there was no way out of it. So with a heavy heart and many sighs, he took the key from the big bunch. When he had opened the door, he stepped in first and thought to cover the likeness so that the king might not perceive it. But 
it was hopeless. The king stood on tiptoe and looked over his shoulder. And when he saw the picture of the maid, so beautiful and glittering with gold and precious stones, he fell swoon into the ground. Trusty John lifted him up, carried him to bed, and thought sorrowfully, The curse has come upon us, gracious heaven! What will be the end of it all? Then he poured wine down his throat till he came to himself again. The first words he spoke were, Oh, who is the original of the beautiful picture? She is the princess of the golden roof, answered Trusty John. Then the king continued, My love for her is so great that if all the leaves on the trees had tongues, they could not express it. My very life depends on my winning her. You are my most trusty John, you must stand by me. The faithful servant pondered how long they were to set about the matter, for it was said to be difficult even to get into the presence of the princess. At length, he hid upon a plan and spoke to the king. All the things she has about her, tables, chairs, dishes, goblets, bowls, and all her household furniture, are made of gold. You have in your treasure five tons of gold. Let the goldsmiths of your kingdom manufacture them into all manner of vases and vessels, into all sorts of birds and game and wonderful beasts that will please her. We shall go to her with them and try our luck. The king summoned all his goldsmiths, and they had to work hard day and night, till at length the most magnificent things were completed. When a ship had been laden with them, the faithful John disguised himself as a merchant, and the king had to do the same, so that they should be quite unrecognizable. And so, they crossed the seas and journeyed till they reached the town where the princess of the golden robe dwelt. Trusty John made the king remain behind on the ship and await his return. Perhaps, he said, I may bring the princess back with me. So, see that everything is in order. Let the gold ornaments be arranged and the whole ship decorated. Then he took a few of the gold things in his apron, went ashore, and proceeded straight to the palace. When he came to the courtyard, he found a beautiful maiden standing at the well, drawing water with two golden pails. And, as she was about to carry away the glittering water, she turned round and saw the stranger, and asked him who he was. Then he replied, I am a merchant, and, opening his apron, he let her peep in. Oh my, she cried, what beautiful gold wares! She set down her pails and examined one thing after the other. Then she said, The princess must see this. She has such a fancy for gold things that she will buy up all you have. She took him by the hand and led him into the palace, for she was the lady's maid. When the princess had seen the wares, she was quite enchanted, and said, 
they are all so beautifully made that I shall buy everything you have. But Trusty John said, I am only the servant of a rich merchant. What I have here is nothing compared to what my master has on his ship. His merchandise is more artistic and costly than anything that has ever been made in gold before. She desired to have everything brought up to her, but he said, There is such a quantity of things that it would take many days to bring them up, and they would take up so many rooms that you would have no space for them in your house. Thus, her desire and curiosity were excited to such an extent that, at last, she said, Take me to your ship. I shall go there myself and view your master's treasures. Then, Trusty John was quite delighted and brought her to the ship. And the king, when he beheld her, saw that she was even more beautiful than her picture and thought every moment that his heart would burst. She stepped onto the ship and the king led her inside. But Trusty John remained behind with the steersman and ordered the ship to push up. Spread all sail that we may fly on the ocean like a bird in the air. Meanwhile, the king showed the princess inside all his gold wares, all his gold wares, every single bit of it. Dishes, goblets, bowls, the birds and game, and all the wonderful beasts. Many hours passed thus, and she was so happy that she did not notice that the ship was sailing away. After she had seen the last thing, she thanked the merchant and prepared to go home. But when she came to the ship's side, she saw that they were on the high seas, far from land, and that the ship was speeding on its way under full canvas. Oh, she cried in terror, I am deceived carried away and betrayed into the water of a merchant. I would rather have died. But the king seized her hand and spake. I am no merchant, but a king of as high birth as yourself. And it was my great love for you that made me carry you off by stratagem. The first time I saw your likeness, I fell to the ground in a swoon. When the princess of the golden roof heard this, she was comforted, and her heart went out to him, so that she willingly consented to become his wife. Now, it happened one day, while they were sailing on the high seas, that Trusty John, sitting on the forepart of the ship, fiddling away to himself, observed three ravens in the air flying toward him. He ceased playing and listened to what they were saying, for he understood their language. The one croaked, Aha! So he is bringing the princess of the golden roof home. Yes, answered the second, but he is not got her yet. Yes, he has, spake the third, for she is sitting beside him on the ship. Then number one began again and cried, That will not help him. When they reach the land, a chestnut horse will dash forward to greet them. The king will wish to mount it, and if he does, it will gallop away with him, and disappear into the air, and he will never see his bride again. 
Is there no escape for him? asked number two. Oh yes. If someone else mounts quickly and shoots the horse dead with the pistol that is taken in the holster, then the young king is saved. But who is to do that? And anyone who knows it and tells him will be turned into stone from his feet to his knees. Then spake number two. I know more than that. Even if the horse is slain, the young king will still not keep his breath. When they enter the palace together, they will find a ready-made wedding shirt in a cupboard, which looks as though it were woven of gold and silver, but is really made of nothing but sulfur and star. When the king puts it on, it will burn him to his marrow and bone. Number 3 asked, Is there no way of escape then? Oh yes, answered number 2. If someone seizes the shirt with gloved hands and throws it into the fire and lets it burn, then the young king is saved. But what's the good? Anyone knowing this and telling it will have half his body turned into stone from his knees to his heart. Then, number three spake. I know yet more. Though the bridal shirt too be burnt, the king hasn't even then secured his bride. When the dance is held after the wedding and the young queen is dancing, she will suddenly grow deadly white and drop down like one dead and unless someone lifts her up and draws three drops of blood from her right side and spits them out again, she will die. But if anyone who knows this betrays it, he will be turned into stone from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. When the ravens had thus conversed, they fled on what? But Trusty John had taken it all in, and was sad and depressed from that time forward. For if he were silent to his master concerning what he had heard, he would involve him in misfortune. But if he took him into his confidence, then he himself would forfeit his life. At last, he said, I will stand by my master, though it should be my ruin. Now when they drew near the land, it came to pass just as the ravens had predicted, and a splendid chestnut horse bounded forward. Capital, said the king, this animal shall carry me to my palace, and was about to mount but Trusty John was too sharp for him, and, springing up quickly, seized the pistol out of the holster and shot the horse dead. Then the other servants of the king, who at no time looked favorably on Trusty John, cried out, What a sin to kill the beautiful beast that was to bear the king to his palace! But the king spake, Silence, let him alone, he is ever my most trusty John. Who knows for what good end he may have done this thing? So they went on their way and entered the palace. And there in the hall stood a cupboard in which lay the ready-made bridal shirt looking for all the world as though it were made of gold and silver. The young king went toward it and was about to take hold of it, but Trusty John, pushing him aside, seized it with his gloved hands, threw it hastily into the fire, and let it burn. 
The other servant commenced grumbling again and said, See, he is actually burning the king's bridal shirt. But the young king spoke, Who knows for what good purpose he does it? Let him alone, he is my most trusty job. Then the wedding was celebrated. The dance began and the bride joined in, but Trusty John watched her countenance carefully. Of a sudden, she grew deadly white and fell to the ground as if she were dead. He at once sprang hastily toward her, lifted her up and bore her to a room where he laid her down and, kneeling beside her, he drew three drops of blood from her right side and spat them out. She soon breathed again and came to herself, but the young king had watched the proceeding and, not knowing why Trusty John had acted as he did, he flew into a passion and cried, Throw him into prison. On the following morning, Sentence was passed on Trusty John, and he was condemned to be hanged. As he stood on the gallows, he said, Everyone doomed to death has the right to speak once before he dies, and I too have that privilege? Yes, said the king, it shall be granted to you. So, Trusty John spoke, I am unjustly condemned, for I have always been faithful to you, and he proceeded to relate how he had heard the raven's conversation on the sea, and how he had to do all he did in order to save his master. Then the king cried, Oh, my most trusty John, pardon, pardon, take him down. But as he uttered the last word, trusty John had fallen lifeless to the ground and was a stone. The king and queen were in despair, and the king spake, Ah, how ill have I rewarded such great fidelity and made them lift up the stone image and place it in his bedroom, near his bed. As often as he looked at it, he wept and said, Oh, if I could only restore you to life, my most trusty John. After a time, the queen gave birth to twins, two small sons, who throve and grew and were a constant joy to her. One day, when the queen was at church, and the two children sat and played with their father, he gazed again full of grief on the stone statue, and sighing, wept. Oh, if I could only restore you to life, my most trusty John. Suddenly, the stone began to speak and said, Yes, you can restore me to life again if you are prepared to sacrifice what you hold most dear. And the king cried out, All I have in the world will I give up for your sake. The stone continued, If you cut off with your own hand the heads of your two children, and smear me with their blood, I shall come back to life. The king was aghast when he heard that he had himself to put his children to death. But when he thought of Trusty John's fidelity and how he had even died for him, he drew his sword and with his own hand cut the heads of his children. And when he had smeared the stone with their blood, life came back, and 
Trusty John stood once more safe and sound before him. He spake to the king, Your loyalty shall be rewarded. And taking up the heads of the children, he placed them on their bodies, smeared the wounds with their blood, and in a minute they were all right again and jumping about as if nothing had happened. Then the king was full of joy, and when he saw the queen coming, he hid trusty John and the two children in a big cupboard. As she entered, he said to her, Did you pray in church? Yes, she answered, but my thoughts dwelt constantly on trusty John and of what he has suffered for us. Then he spake, Dear wife, we can restore him to life, but the price asked is our two little sons. We must sacrifice them. The queen grew white and her heart sank, but she replied, We owe it to him on account of his great fidelity. Then he rejoiced that she was of the same mind as he had been, and going forward he opened the cupboard and fetched the two children and Trusty John out, saying, God be praised, Trusty John is free once more, and we have our two small sons again. Then he related to her all that had passed, and they lived together happily ever afterward. Thank you for hanging out with me on tonight's episode. I hope you enjoy tonight's story. Do have a restful night and sleep tight my dear friend.